this is uh, March 7th, uh, the day after the debate, here at uh, uh, Winter Park Public Library. Uh, we are uh, doing question and answer with Commissioner Sprinkle. Uh, and uh, feel free to add anything you like, Ms. Sprinkle. Uh, my first question to you is, what is your vision for our city? Uh, and uh, connected with that, why are you running for re-election for commissioner? Well, as I've told you before, and you know and realize I'm a long-time resident of the city of Winter Park. I've been here 42 years. I've been here uh, and watched it change, and I want to be a part of keeping it the way I love it to be. And so for me, uh, when my son said, Mom, every child should have the opportunity to grow up like I did, I know that's what I want for so many people. I don't know if you realize it, but we we're on the cover of U.S. Air magazine and everybody who gets on that plane is going to see the city of Winter Park this month. So there's a lot of people who know what a special place that we live in. Everyone who visits here knows that. So for me, my vision is to, to keep our community so that people can continue to have the families grow up the way we've had a chance to have our family grow up. And so that's one of the, the major reasons I'm running is because I want our community to remain the way it is. Uh, what would you say is the most, single most important issue? Uh, For me, the single most important issue is your budget. It has to be your budget because all the things we talk about, we can't do unless we're fiscally sound. And we are, we are on good, strong, fiscal sound right now. We haven't always been. We, one time, not that long ago, our reserves were down to $100,000. That's very, very low. That's hand to mouth. We can't operate that way. So. Um, we've set a goal. We're a very goal-oriented commission, and we're going to achieve that goal. So that's one of the reasons why uh, I've always understood that finances matter, and finances certainly matter with your city. And so to me, the most important thing is to be physically sound. And that means when you deal with your police and your fire and your pensions and you deal with your roads and you deal with your trees and you deal with your water, and in our case, we deal with our parks, all of that fits together. So we are the stewards for you, the community. And it's really important as a steward for you to make the right decisions about how we spend our money. What was it that got us in such a bind, would you say, and how is it that we've dug our way out? We've dug our way out by being very, very strict on how we spend our money. And we used to have 575 employees in the city, and we have 500 now. That's down 75 employees. That's a big hit. So that means that you can't do the same thing with people. You have to do it with technology and other aspects. I don't really know. I can't tell you exactly all the things that happened to make that. I don't even want to pr predict and, and project that. I can tell you that, that to keep our bonds, and our bonding ability where it is. We need, to, we need to continue to keep the rainy day fund where it is. And so we're very pleased that we're you know, close to our goal, 27%, it's 30%, we're close. Uh, every year, there's things I'd like to spend money on that we just can't spend it on to, until we know that we have four months supply of money in case something happens. But if you're reelected, mm -hmm. um, beyond, is there anything beyond what you've already said uh, as far as how you're going to lead on the issue of being fiscally responsible, or have you pretty much covered it in your prior answer? Well, the, the fiscal responsibility is with each of us, and the budget is the most important thing we do. There's no question about that. So uh, we've worked together very well to come up with a good budget. So I don't think it's something that pits one against the other. We have a, a CPA for a city manager. That helps. That helps. And so we know that we have those kinds of things working for us and with us. So I'm, I'm not going to go out there and say, let's spend it here and there. Obviously, we're going to spend it on the, on the road trees. We've already said that. And so those are the things that we have to do. Where will that million dollars come from the first year? That's what we have to look for. Uh, why do you think current city residents moved to Winter Park in the first place? When I ask people that, and I do ask people that, most people will say, and I just met a couple the other day who, uh, who some went to Berry College. They were from Boston. There's some went to Berry College. They used to come down and visit him. That's out on Highway 50 out by Union Park. They said they just drove around and they found us. And they said, this reminds me of home. So a lot of people come here because it reminds them of home, whatever home is. I grew up in a town of 5,000 people. Now. 
the town I grew up in has only 4,000 people now, okay? It hasn't been able to even hold its own. But I thought it was the most idyllic place in the world because it was home. But this is, it feels like home to lots of people. We have so many beautiful things. People like beauty. People prefer it. And so that's what we have. And we have to maintain that. It sounds like you're, you're saying that a, uh, an important part of what we represent to the residents is sort of a small town. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not been easy to do since we've had this huge growth around us. When you look at, we've had 30% growth in the city of Winter Park since 1970. In 1970, we had 22,000 people. We now have 28,000 people, okay? We're projected to go down in growth to 26, not up in growth. But around us in this great big metropolitan area, in 1970, there were 500,000 people, and now there's 2.2 million people. So we have maintained a lot of our smallness because some of our growth was from annexation. So as I, as I having lived here 40 plus years, when I drive home, it's not that much different for me than when I used to drive home in 1972, okay? But it is for people, for some people, I understand that, because traffic's bad. Uh, you mentioned yesterday uh, in the debate here in this room uh, something along the lines of uh, the fact that change is inevitable, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we, we need to accept that and manage that. Uh, is it your feeling that residents are going to embrace the changes that are coming to the city in the near term and potentially even in the longer term as far as what you can see now as to the shape of those changes? Uh, I think the residents make those changes. I don't think I make those changes. I think the residents make those changes. So will residents embrace them? Residents have to make them, not me. I'm going to respond to what residents want. Let's use this library as one of example. This library, I've been hearing lots of conversation about the library. We want a new library. And I'm like, great, wonderful. You know, where would we put it? That's a change. I told people in one of the first debates, my car knows its way to this library. My son's plaque is right upstairs on the second floor of the children's department. But when I first moved to Winter Park, the library was a little building right over where All Saints Church is now. And I went to that library too. I was at this library when there were two stories. I'm at this library when there's three stories. Change occurs, okay? So will the residents make the change? They have to make the change because I could never make a change for people. The residents have to make it. Uh, getting back to what we were talking about a couple of minutes ago, uh, the sense that uh, uh, this city, this town reminds people of the homes, the cities they came from, mm -hmm. uh, the, the fact that it's a small town feel. Um, there are some that hold that we have always been first and foremost, a city of homes, and we should stay that way. Um, there are others who support significantly expanding the commercial sector here, and they claim that uh, commercial expansion is a, is a net benefit to city residents, uh, and that those residents will share and increase jobs uh, and revenues, uh, and also because businesses will pay more city taxes, uh, and as a result, city residents will pay less. Do you see it that way? I do. I do. And, and if, if you look at the history, you can see it that way because we were never formed as a city of homes. We were formed as an incorporated city. When we started this and, the, and our forefathers started Winter Park, they started Park Avenue around the train station. And the, the homes were the winter homes for the people that they were going to bring in. So it began as a full service city. It didn't, begun, didn't become... Uh, never started as a suburb, so to speak. None of us see ourselves as a suburb of Orlando. We always have been our own entity. So I do see that. And, and here's, the, here's the truth of it. At one time in the city, in this community, we had a 70-30 mix. 70% 70 of our taxes were paid by the homeowners and 30% by, by the businesses. And now it's 80-20. That's dangerous, getting dangerously close to us having to take on too much as homeowners. So we'd love to see it return to 70-30. So how do you do that? You have to build your base. You have to build your base of businesses. And we don't want to build those in our downtown core. We want to build those in the outside areas. That, at one time, were not even part of Winter Park, have been annexed to become part of Winter Park. Because Outley Road wasn't part of Winter Park. Out Fairbanks wasn't part of Winter Park. Those have become parts of Winter Park. Uh, one thing that is uh, part of the conversation has been for years now, certainly during the recession, is jobs, jobs, jobs. And one of the, part of the promise of development is jobs. 
and then the, uh, the jobs conversation locally and nationally uh, goes from the question of jobs to what kind of jobs. Right. So uh, among the development, developments that are happening now in the city of Winter Park, uh, what kinds of jobs do you think that those will create and uh, will those jobs go primarily to our citizens? I I'm just wondering about the benefits that these developments throw off in terms of their revenues and their jobs and how they get distributed among citizens, not just of Winter Park, but also the larger metro area. How, how do you see that benefiting the Winter Park residents in particular? Well, I'm not sure if you're speaking about a certain specific development, but let's just talk about the CNL building that just got built. What's going to go in there are businesses. And a, a number of those businesses are going to be headquartered right here. And theoretically, people like to live close to their businesses. So that's how that would impact it. I'm not sure what other development you're speaking about. Our senior living homes that have just been developed, fabulous senior living homes, full for people from Winter Park and Maitland living in there. They can walk across the street to Publix. Those are the kinds of things that there's, it's hard for me to call that anything but, but fantastic for this community. Yeah, and some of the developments that I was referring to, I mean, CNL certainly is part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, when you think of Lakeside, uh, right. within the Northwest area and, and what Mayor Bradley is, I think, called a hot development corridor, Denning, 1792. Uh, we know that Lakeside is going in. Uh, we know the Trader Joe's. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and they're also going to have a Blue Cross Blue Shield. That's going to be the two big things. There. Sure. That's going to be that. Uh, and uh, do we know yet what's going in where Kmart is? I, I, know, I don't have a clue. I mean, I, I'll tell you my philosophy about all of that and, and uh, whether it's good, bad, right or wrong, it's been my philosophy from the beginning. I don't go to meetings before they come to me. I don't do it on purpose. I go, I, when the meetings come to me and when all the, the information is on the table, I go find out about it. I learn everything I possibly can and I research it greatly. I don't go trying to find out what's going on because what I've learned is I hear this rumor and I hear that rumor and did I know so-and-so bought this and so-and-so is going to do that and it never happens. So I don't really know what's going to go there. It hasn't been to us yet. So I don't know what's going there. Um, going back to a key rationale for development, um, and I've heard this mentioned in City Hall a number of times, which is um, a savings in city taxes uh, um, of our residents um, versus business. Um, I'm wondering if, if you've seen data or aware of uh, how that will actually translate uh, in terms of the average Winter Park resident. Um, if we had a, a significant increase in commercial development, considering what the average winter partner may pay in city taxes, uh, do you get some sense of uh, what kinds of savings uh, our residents might see as a result of development like this? Uh, it, would it be 10%? What would that translate to in real dollars? What, what have you seen in terms of studies along those lines? I, I don't have that study, so I can't answer that. I can tell you that if you look at, at how it works and you look at adding 200 million dollars to the tax base, that's $50,000 to the city. Okay, That's not a great deal of money, but it's $50,000 that was not designated to anybody else. Okay, I just looked at something that came across my desk last night that showed the housing uh, startups in this community and how many were happening and who was adding on and all of that. And I just did a little figure to see how much money it included. So I'm always looking at that, but that it takes a while to, to turn that around. I don't think you're going to ever see your taxes go down. What I can tell you is they haven't been raised in five years, and if I'm elected, they won't be raised for three more. Um, the staying in the Denning Corridor uh, and in that area, let's talk about the Lee Road punch through for a moment. Okay. Um, I, I realize that uh, based on what has been said uh, in commission uh, meetings and elsewhere, that technically that is determined uh, by the DOT, the Florida DOT, and not by the city. But it's more, been, more than technically. <laughs> they have two state roads intersecting there. Uh, they have Lee Road and they have 1792. And they are in control of that intersection. True, but it's okay. also been mentioned by Randy Knight and, and right. others that DOT is sensitive Absolutely. to uh, city sentiment right. and, and to the position that um, city government takes. Right. And, and I know that this is a work in progress. Um, I, I'm wondering if this punch through happens, um, with that said, 
do you get the feeling that that could push traffic um, toward Park Avenue and into our city neighborhoods in and around Denny? I would hope not. And, and can I just stop and tell you that I don't support a punch through? Now, I don't, whether I support you or not personally doesn't really matter. Okay, but what we're finding out right now, and the reason I don't support it is, what's been given to me as a rationale is this. The state wants 1792 to, to, to run smoothly through our city. And you know what? I don't care. I don't really want to make 72, 1792 move smoothly through our city. So for me, I know what moves smoothly is, that's a Loma Avenue. I don't want that on that side of town. So 1792 to me, I know it's a, a problem there because you've got a T intersection. And if you move it to Denning, you're going to have another T intersection where you're going to have another issue. Now, maybe it won't be so great because only the people that would go to Denning would be coming into town. But I don't want to really want to make it easy to have a big flow through main road there. So personally, I don't support that. Now, our 2003 uh, commission already said, yeah, we think we can approve this, and they did. And that's why it got on the list. So we're, we're really trying to find out. We're, we'll be in Tallahassee in a couple of weeks. It's the kind of thing that should, in fact, be, if, if we think that we have a shot at changing it, we need to, to get the people involved and change it. Now, why have we not done that yet? Because we, didn't, we don't know. We don't know. You have a gentleman out there who's amassing a lot of property there. So the city may not have anything to do with it anyway, because if he approves it, he may be able to do it without us. It's my understanding that uh, he has either informally or formally been asked to uh, pony up in a big way for the cost of doing that punch through if it's going to be done and if it's approved by the DOT. And looking at his development plans, this is uh, Mr. Scott Fish. I, I know with, all about with, it, right, uh, obviously. And yeah. I, I know that he's been communicating with the city. Um, is it your sense from what you've heard that uh, the success of Mr. Fish's development there with, where Whole Foods is currently anchoring that development is uh, requires uh, Lee Road to come through that development? My sense is what I've heard. We haven't seen anything. Nothing's been presented to us. It's not in writing in any form or fashion. Is that if he wants access from Lee Road into his development, then he has to pony up, as you, as you use the term. But I don't know. I mean, you've heard it. I've heard it. I don't know any of that stuff because nothing's been presented to us. So I can't tell you any of that. Now, you stated that you uh, do not support uh, a punch through. I and, do not. And, and that uh, leads me to believe that you are sensitive to the potential for uh, gridlock, traffic gridlock in our city uh, in coming years. Um, I, am I correct in that assumption? Do you see that as a potential I, I, I danger would never, for our city? I would never say that I'm, I support gridlock in our city. No, <laughs> that would not be a very wise thing for me well, to ever say. that's not what I'm asking you. Yeah. I, I'm saying it seems to me that you're uh, lack of support for the punch through uh -huh. indicates that you may be sensitive to that issue and I'm wondering whether you see that as a potential um, uh, if we're not careful in coming years relative to development punch through or not in that part of the city. Well what's happening out there right now and this is when you have to look at the big region so uh -huh. you've got I-4 adding all those lanes so you're going to have some problems on that on that 1792 while that's happening because people are going to start using 1792. We can just we can just speak to that right now because it parallels it for a way there. So so I would I would suggest that some of that's going to be taken off with the the interstate and when I4 has has the additional lanes on it. I4 is being designed to carry a lot of people because there's a lot of people in this area. Most people who want to travel quickly are going to get on that road and not 1792. Very good. Uh, if Winter Parkers, it seems that with uh, additional infrastructure and development uh, in, in Winter Park generally, uh, that Winter Parkers may find themselves in a situation that larger cities experience, which is uh, people waiting a little longer at traffic lights, uh, waiting longer at restaurants, waiting longer in lines. Generally. You're from LA, right? Uh, no, yeah. I, I'm from here, but, but I no, no, but you lived in LA years. for a while. You know about traffic, well, right? Well, I do, <laughs> and I spent some time in Atlanta as well. Yes, yeah, so. both very nice cities in their right. own way. But uh, residents there seem to have come to accept that that's mm -hmm. part of their lives. Right. And uh, I'm wondering whether uh, you think Winter Parkers will be as accepting. <laughs> 
uh, it's a really good boy. And I'm teasing you when I say that because I've been in LA when I'm thinking, really, two hours to get from here to there? That's only this many miles? So I don't see, I mean, traffic is not great here. I mean, we don't like traffic here, but traffic is nothing here like it is in these other places that I've been in. So. I don't know. I don't know what we'll do for that because it's a it's a hard thing. It's it's always about the wait time. People are very impatient, and uh, I, I don't know how to how to answer that. Right. It's the people around us that are creating the problem here, and we're not going to stop the people around us from growing. Uh, connected to cars is the. Uh, issue of parking garages right and it seems as though uh, the words parking garage are uttered in city meetings with some regularity uh, and I'm wondering relative to the construction of those garages uh, who are those garages for now I realize that in most cases they're to service commercial developments uh, and, and to, to help with parking generally in the area and the downtown district and so on so I, I understand that but uh, there's a question of who will be parking in those garages. Uh, will, will the, are, is the construction of garages significantly to accommodate winter parkers as they use these commercial amenities? Or, or would you say that parking garages uh, are primarily for people who will be coming from outside our city? Well, I think it's for both. Okay. Because you won't have this city if you don't have people coming from the outside. Because 28,000 people are not enough people to support our business district. So you're going to always have to have people from outside to come in. Uh, you know if you've been at the meetings and you're always there, I am not a fan of parking garages. That's why it was so hard for me to approve what happened over at the hospital. But they worked on that. They got it down that floor. I was much, much more content with it after that happened. So many things are happening with parking garages now to make them more attractive if there is such a thing and to put different kinds of lighting on them. So the, the parking garages we build today don't look like the ones built 20 years ago. So I'm very much uh, more content with them. I understand that you can't have surface parking all over your town. I mean, nobody would want to do that. So there's a place for parking garages. Okay. Let's shift gears. Uh, why do Winter Park residents need a minor league baseball stadium? I don't know that Winter Park residents do need a minor league baseball stadium. That's not even been my big question. I know there's a lot of people out there who would like to go watch minor league baseball. And I know that, that it's, it could be lots of fun for lots of people. And when people start talking about bringing something into your community that can be a big revenue generator, as a commissioner, I'm going to open my ears and listen. So when we received the information that, shared, that was shared with us that showed as much as a $6 million influx, not to the city, but to the people who have businesses in this city, I can't close the door on that. On the other hand, I've been very clear, and you know this from being there, about the things that I needed in order to ever approve something like that. And first and foremost, and this just cannot be said louder, we can't use city money. And we've said it, we're not going to use city money, but sometimes people still say we are, but we're not. It's very, very clear we're not using city money. So I don't, I don't know that Winter Park residents have the skin of the game that you think they do, because it's not their money. We have private people coming in, just like you have with Scott Fish. Do we get to control what Scott Fish bills? So if we have a, 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 someone coming in there that wants to work with Rollins and put together a whole lot of people that want to spend their money here and put together a, 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 a team, or not a team, but a, a stadium, I've been to lots of games. I enjoy them. My family loves them. I've talked to lots of people who are excited about it. But I think where it would go is really important. I do not want the city to be in any form or fashion in the driver's seat there. I think we can be the convener of people. These are things I've set at the table, so it's not new. And absolutely no city money. Now, um, it, it looks, looking at projections for the mm -hmm. entire project, it looks as though if we uh, accept at face value the dollars that the principals have talked about contributing, um, which fall in the two to three million dollar range. We're still looking at a twenty million dollar shortfall minimally. Uh, and I'm wondering if you can help me understand the difference between city money 
and uh, the city bonding for the money. Are you making a distinction no, no, there? They, absolutely not bonding the money. Absolutely never bonding the money. I would never do that. So city money bonding, bonding you your city the money, same. they are the same. Okay? okay, It's all your money. We will not do that in my mind, and I would okay. certainly never support that. Now, here, here's the, the big leap you're missing, either because you didn't hear it or you weren't there or, or whatever. Well, we had the gentleman who came in and we did the workshop. He gave us very clearly what he believed they would do. He said, if I have four more months and I can look at, at, at the people who may be doing this, and apparently there's been some new people even to come up since then, we, we, will, we know, and I bet you heard this, we know that in order for this to work, the team owner has to put in between 30 and 35% of it, okay? So that's his goal. And, and I said, so what you're telling me is this doesn't work if you don't get that much from the team owner. And he said, you're right. So basically, that's one of those, one of those um, things that you can't get past. So if they don't have that, they're not going to go to the next step. So I'm willing to let those people, that that's their business. That's what that gentleman does. He puts those people together. They come up with different sources for those monies. But he's given us those figures. Now, what you saw on the table originally with 2000 here and 3000 there, there's no way you're going to get a stadium bill because there's not enough money. And so, obviously, I'm willing to give them that opportunity to go out and see what they can do. Okay. Uh, and have you uh, heard or gotten any concrete indication from uh, ownership uh, that they have any intention or ability to, to come close to contributing that amount? We of have not had any kind of report back or anything like that. I hear things all the time, but okay. I hear things that I do that I don't know anything about. So, you know, <laughs> okay. I hear things, but I, don't have, I know nothing because it has not come back. I think that the fact that we give them that opportunity to do whatever it is they're going to do, at one time when we were at that meeting, I wanted to say very much, okay, so what you're telling me is if we don't know this in so many days, we're going to stop this or we're going to start this. If that's not my role. My role is to let them work the process. And they're going to come back with a recommendation. They know I don't want Martin Luther King Park. I already said I don't want that park. There's no way I can be the chairperson of the Dr. Martin Luther King Task Force for the renaming and name that park one year and the next year come back and change it. So I asked at the table, and I think you were there, if we could take that out of the mix. And uniformly, people said, let's leave everything we can on the table so that we can deal. And I said, okay. They know how I feel, don't they? Yes, and you have been clear about that. And uh, the sense that I get uh, from listening to people inside and outside the city is that uh, Martin Luther King Park will, will be a heavy lift, um, mm -hmm. uh, which leaves uh, Harper Shepard Field. Uh, which uh, I understand is a questionable site due to it, the fact that it's landlocked. It's, it's a small landlocked parcel. Uh, and if we assume that that's correct, then what remains on the table is primarily uh, the Votex site and uh, Ravnage. Um, you have a background in education. Um, what's your feeling about uh, the pros and the cons of uh, a stadium locating on the Votex site um, as far as it impacts that sort of education and beyond? Well, the Winter Park Botech Center is a vital part of our community. I would never want to see it replaced. I mean, I would love to see a new building, just like they would, but I do not want to lose the Winter Park Botech Center. It's on the bus line, it's there, and I have lots of people that are saying that same thing. Now, is the school board willing to sell it? I don't know that. Is the school board willing to sell it? Probably only if they got a new building, okay? So that, those are the things that I, I, this is not my job. My job is to tell you that I, I would think that would be a really hard, heavy lift. <laughs> um, uh, changing gears a little bit, we've been talking about parks. Um, there's a lot of talk about parks in this city. Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, why, why do Winter Park residents feel so strongly about parks? and by extension, they're trees. What, what is the meaning of that for the city of Winter Park? Well, maybe because it's in our name. I mean, Winter Park, right? We put the park in it, that, and I mean, just the idea of, of green around you and trees above you, all of that just gives you a feeling. It, 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 I don't even separate it from water. I think so much of what our community has is the great waters, the lakes, and our wonderful tree canopy. Those are things that you can't get everywhere, and it it's the kind of thing that comes into your being without you realizing it. You sense it through your skin. 
you feel it wherever you go. So there's a feeling you get here that other people don't have. Uh, now, connected with trees, um, you know, we, The Voice, covers a number of city meetings every month, and we've heard talk inside City Hall uh, that undergrounding of Winter Park's power lines, which is directly connected to trees and, and what happens to our trees, is something that could potentially be accelerated, um, possibly accomplished in 10 years or less, which is a little bit different than the timetables I've heard discussed among commissioners on the Davis. Um, and that that could potentially be accomplished at little or no additional cost to the city uh, if you take into account the cost savings uh, of maintaining the trees that are paid out every year right now to deal with trees around power lines. Uh, that and other factors. Are, are you aware that um, a 10-year a ten year uh, time frame has been discussed and uh, would you support a 10-year time frame? I'm pretty aware of it. I was there when we had the discussion. Okay. We had a work session on that and uh, we actually decided not to. I was very supportive of that. Let uh, me tell you okay. why I was supportive of it and then tell you why I realize we can't do that, okay? okay? When we went in, the reason I'm supportive of trying to underground quicker is because basically everywhere I go, people ask me, when am I going to get undergrounded? When am I going to get undergrounded? And if there's any one thing you need to do to this city, that would be it. Now we got these green boxes I don't care for, we got to deal with that too, but I will tell you that we got to trade a little bit. So underground is important. When the city voted, when the, when the people in this community voted for undergrounding, they voted on it on a 25 year plan. So they didn't vote for it for 10 years, they didn't vote for it for 15 years, they voted for it for 25 years. In order for us to accelerate it, what it would actually do, what it would mean all of our money would go there. So we wouldn't have the money left over. I can tell you from our tight budget right now, we would have to put more money into that. And what would also happen is that you can't tear up a city so much that you can't move around. So one of the things that Jerry Warren has told us is that it's very easy for us to underground five miles a year. It doesn't tear up the city. We can do that. It's a fairly easy way to do. So we've been on that kind of a time frame, five miles a year. Now, if we accelerate that, we're going to start having lots of problems with trying to get around because of that. But, but that's one of the things. We had a work session on it. We decided as a commission not to try to accelerate it at this time. Now, as far as trees go, one of the reasons we ended up with the urban study is because these two entities have to work together. You can't have one part of the city burying things and cutting trees and the other part not knowing where it's going to happen. You can't have a, somebody coming one day and cutting a tree and the no, another group coming the next day. So we've gone a long way to getting that together. We've got one department now, we've got all this working together, and the Urban Tree Study gives us a lot of information we've never had before. So that's why it's painful to have to wait. I, I know that. But the planning will definitely pay off dividends. Is it, so is it your feeling then that the, uh, this, this quote 10 year plan uh, was not truly revenue neutral then. That, that seems to be what I'm hearing from you, that you and other commissioners felt that it just wasn't revenue neutral. You've indicated it will suck all the available money, extra money. We talked about uh, it quite a bit. Were you there when we did, we had the work session? It was it last was. spring, yeah, yeah. And it was, we, we, really, we really did uh, work around that and it just didn't seem like it was the right time. Maybe it'll come back again. But I, it was one of those, because I really wanted that and then I realized I was one of those that had to listen to everybody. And when Jerry said that about how it tears your city apart, mm -hmm. and I remember when we bricked Park Avenue, it was so brilliant. These guys, Gary Brewer was the mayor, these guys were so smart when they did it. They didn't just tear the whole city up for a long time. They did it one block at a time, one lane at a time. They were very wise how they did it. We just have to do it wisely. I get the feeling that um, uh, the city commission uh, sees the uh, excess dollars earned by the electric department um, as monies that, yes, will primarily go to uh, projects like undergrounding, but that they, they, they seem to be interested in carving out a portion of those profits, um, those revenues, uh, to do things like uh, 
put dollars back into the general fund and so on. Do you think now, that's Do you have an example of, of that? Uh, well, I, I don't have one here. In I, front I, of I me, don't have one in my head because I yeah. don't know that that's ever happened. So when okay. you say that, I want you to tell me when we did that because sure. my understanding, and I have never done that since I've been on the okay. commission. So I don't. I want us to be real careful because right now the utility uh, we paid back to the to the city what when we bought the the utility we sure. had to borrow money. Okay, and we made enough money to pay it back early. Mm -hmm. Okay, by we, I'm talking the city. I'm talking the. You get a lot of ownership when you work in this role for the okay. things that you do. So I don't have an example of what you're saying because I don't think that's happened. So you're, you're not aware of that part of the profits uh, have been pulled out or discussed being pulled out to be put into the general fund as opposed to having them allocated toward undergrounding? That, that's, I mean, you're saying something that we haven't done. Okay, all right, well I'll have to go back and check that. Okay. Uh, Relative, you know, moving on from... I will say yeah. that we gave people, the public, a rebate last year. I don't mm -hmm. know if you remember that in the summer. And instead, we had some funding that came back to us from the utilities, and that's how we chose to spend it. That maybe could have gone, but it was a utility, uh, uh, and it was a... Uh, it was in their budget, and that's what we chose to do. It was in the summer months. So, so rather than going it stayed into the in utility. Fund, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I understand. Uh, I know how you feel about bonding generally. Mm -hmm. uh, is it your feeling that if there were uh, a significant groundswell of support among city residents to speed up um, undergrounding, um, despite the points that you've made about inconvenience, that uh, that would be a project that would be worthy of consideration for bonding in the city? I would not want to, uh, to bond undergrounding, no. Okay. Um, moving now, on. Now, again, if this, yeah. the public said that, they have not in my mind. I've been out there knocking on doors. That's not what they're saying. Okay. Let, let's move on to something else. Uh, preservation. Mm -hmm. um, is preservation of Winter Park's historic homes and districts and neighborhoods important to this city? Uh, and, or, or maybe better put, why is it important to the city and how important is it? Well, it is. I mean, history is vital to any city, but it's especially vital to this city and to this community. So, absolutely, it's important. And I, don't, I think uniformly we all agree that it is. So, I don't think that's a question. Do we want to preserve? I think everybody does. It's how we achieve that goal that everybody wants that's important. Are you going to achieve it with, you know, a heavy hand? Are you going to achieve it with people opting in? Are you going to, how are you going to achieve it? Now, um what happened with uh, Cape and House being financed, as far as the move is concerned, could be seen as a, a free market solution uh, to uh, dealing with the issue of the Cape and House needing to move from the site that it's on now. And, and I believe that I've, I've heard uh, commissioners endorse how the community came together to make that happen. So that was the, a, a way that government may have encouraged that, but that uh, citizens uh, actually made that happen. Uh, I'm wondering if the same feeling about free market solutions and, and simply encouragement from the city and, and not much more uh, also applies to uh, development in and around our uh, commercial corridors along Park Avenue with our merchants. Is it your sense that a free market uh, is primarily the way that uh, these solutions should be created or does the city have a role in uh, helping to finance historic preservation at some points, helping to finance um, development, commercial development, um, through incentives and, and so on. What, what's your opinion about the proper role of city government? That's a really good question because uh, I, I do think the reason that I'm a city commissioner is because we do have a role in all of that. We have a role that plays in, in, in uh, incentivizing people, incentivizing businesses to come here. We haven't done any of that, but if that becomes something that we could do or had the funding to do, or can you incentivize people just, I'm, I'm a big believer in intrinsic motivation. You know, can people intrinsically be motivated to do what it is that we think might make us feel better? The library will close in 15. If you need assistance, please ask a staff member at this time. <laughs> I guess that's over. Okay. okay. Um, all right, and, and so did you did you say what you wanted to say on that? Yeah, I'm not really sure exactly what you're looking for. I will tell you that I think they both go hand in hand, that you can't just depend on one without the other, that they have to work together. But the role of the government is to respond to the, the community. It's not to be somewhere else. It's to respond to what you as the community wants. 
I'm wondering if uh, you will, we're wrapping up now, but I, I'm wondering if you will, if you're able to, to, to spell out and, uh, with some examples, uh, some fairly concrete detail, uh, how uh, benefits, uh, what the benefits of development, how they ripple out to our citizens. Um, you know, we've talked about some of the downsides, like potential congestion uh, and that sort of thing. But uh, also in the context of uh, the baseball stadium, um, other kinds of development, uh, there's often talk about how uh, additional revenues and business growth uh, is good for the city. What's good for business is good for the city. Uh, and, but it's generally left at, at, at that as sort of an assumption that that must be true. Can you, based on your own experience, uh, and what you've heard uh, in your private life and as a, an official of the city of Park. Can you give some sense of how that actually works in a concrete sense uh, for uh, our residents? What, what are the concrete benefits residents receive from enhanced uh, revenues and development and, and so on? You know, development's not a four-letter word and it's uh, not a nasty word. This whole community was developed by developers. And so development's not bad. Development mm -hmm. is change. So let me give you two or three examples, just like you asked. I'm a member of Congregational Church right over here. I've been going there for a really long time, and we started Rollins College. Rollins College is a beautiful college, and Rollins College has some needs, and, and they've changed some buildings over there. And those buildings, I went into their building. That's their new science center, and it's beautiful. And what's going on in that building is great. We also, at our church over here, opened up the, the Mayflower. We built the Mayflower, got it going. The Mayflower is a fabulous place for senior living. It's wonderful. And when we went, started looking at building that for our citizens here in this community, it was one of those things that wasn't easy to do. We had to deal with it for a long time. And I look at that now when I go to the Mayflower and I think how wise we were to create this great development, to create some place that people can go and live. It's perfect for them. So I see that as development. And then I'll go to my favorite schools. Uh, I taught at Lake Mount Elementary School in, from 1976 to 1980. When I was teaching at Lake Mount Elementary School, the wall of our school, I was on the last, last uh, room, actually c caved in when we were in class one day. It was that bad. That's, the school was so old, and it was just replaced about three years ago, right? That's development. That new school is developed. It's two stories now. It used to be one story. Two stories. It's a beautiful school. There's much better place for your kids to be in school. So how does that impact the school? I'll just tell or impact the community. People do better when they're in places that are taken care of. So I look at the Mayflower. I look at Lake Mont and Brookshire this year where my son went to school. And, and I see those are places that have been developed into other things that are, that are great. I am not a big shopper. I admit it. I do all my shopping on Park Avenue. Always have, always will. You'd have to kill me to go to a mall. I don't go to malls, okay? So if I can't find it on Park Avenue, I just don't get it. And so I don't, I'm not looking forward to shopping because I don't, I don't shop. But I go to the grocery store because we all got to eat. And so I keep hearing about Trader Joe's and I'll look forward to going there. But I doubt that I'll change my habit. I have a habit of going to the Publix right up by my house, and that's probably where I'll go. In fact, when I leave here, that's where I'm going. So I, I don't see that, that those kinds of things have changed. They changed that Publix not long ago. When they changed it, people said, I, I liked it the old way. But now people are used to the new way. It's just hard to change. You know, my great quote I read one time about change is they say the only people who like change are babies, and that's because they're wet. So I'll tell you that I know it's hard. To, to embrace change, and I understand that. And sometimes I wish nothing ever changed in my life. But it will, whether we plan for it or not. Uh, my final question, too. Uh, both you and your opponent, uh, and uh, I'm certain this is true of thousands of candidates all around the nation, have pledged that you do not support tax increases. Uh, is there anything that you can think of that uh, Winter Parkers would willingly pay more taxes for? I can think that some would, but no, there's nothing, yeah. Because I hear all these people now say to me, well, Sarah, I'll pay more taxes. If you look at our tax base and you look at our, our makeup of people in this community, no, they won't. There's a handful that will, but they will not. Uh, we are, this is uh, going to be one of the uh, last chances you get uh, to talk to voters before okay. the election coming up uh, next week. 
Uh, is there anything more that you'd like to say or anything we haven't covered that you'd like to elaborate on before we end the interview? Well, thank you for that opportunity. And you all may not know that Tom and I get to see each other a lot because his dad and my mother are at the same nursing home. And that's a real pleasure. Uh, having things like our parents close to us in the nursing home, that we can wheel them around town and be very, very, very familiar with this whole town. All I can say is that I've enjoyed thoroughly and honored, been honored to be a commissioner for the last three years. I take this job very seriously. I work hard at doing the best job I can for people. I was always surprised when people said to me, well, Sarah, you have all these friends. I do. I have 150 contributors. That's a lot of people. They've contributed everything from $10 to $1,000. I have one person that gave me $1,000. Can you imagine? And so I have lots of friends. I've been here a long time. But I don't owe anybody anything. I don't owe my soul to anyone. I'm very independent. I've always been independent. And for anyone to say otherwise is just, first of all, it's an indictment of me personally. It's wrong. And they don't know me. I've never been that way. People who know me know. And most people now say, you know what? You are an independent thinker. So I'm glad that it may have taken some people three years to figure that out, something that I always knew about myself. And, and I know that I do a good job for the city. I know that right now we're working really well together as a team, and I'd like to continue that teamwork. Commissioner Sprinkle, thank you thank so you. much. Mm -hmm.